different uh, criteria or different qualifications are used. That's why this bill asks that school districts use a standardized rating process to, to rate contractors. I think uh, Assemblyman Berryhill asked a question on the last bill, aren't school districts allowed to already pre-qualify? The answer is yes, they are. If they use a, a current system uh, that was allowed under current law, they're allowed to continue to use that system under the bill. If they go into a new process, they're, they're required to use the model form that the Department of Industrial Relations has drafted, but it's only a model form. You know, the, the bill says it, that their pre-qualification process needs to be substantially similar, but not exact. So they can modify it for their own current conditions, their own current needs, and we think that gives the school districts the flexibility to uh, run a good pre-qualification program, and we ask for your I vote. Thank you. Madam Chair and Member Scott Wetch on behalf of the California State Pipe Trades Council, the State Association of Electrical Workers, and the Western States Council of Sheet Metal Workers. State law requires that uh, projects, public works projects, be let in most instances to the lowest responsible bidder. Back in 1998, I sponsored legislation with then Assemblymember Fred Keeley, AB 921, which codified case law as to a definition of what a responsible bidder was. And the code lists out several different characteristics, including a contractor that has the experience, the qualifications, the financial capability to complete the project, meaning you don't get somebody who's never done a $50 million project, uh, a job to do a $50 million project, and the core, the character uh, and good moral standing to be able to complete the project. The problem is you have bad actors who have actually been convicted of crimes, fraud, uh, uh, other sorts of criminal, criminal violations who have been sued by various entities, but because various public agencies are not, in this case school districts, are not using the same qualification process or some perhaps aren't qualifying, pre-qualifying at all, these scoff laws are able to float from jurisdiction to jurisdiction without having a trail that follows them. This helps prevent that and in these times makes good fiscal sense and would urge an I vote. Thank you. Madam Chair and members, Caitlin Vega for the California Labor Federation also here in support. This bill is particularly important in these economic times when everyone is looking for ways to cut corners. And of course that's important, but for a school, safety has to be of the utmost importance. And when they're looking at contractors, it really is important that they understand what the record is and that they have the ability to evaluate contractors in the way that is not only best for the taxpayers, but also best for the school community and for the students. So we think that this is an important bill. We're here in strong support. Patrick, you're going to have the California State Council of Labor, and for all the reasons you've heard before, we support. Thank you. Bill Vermeulen, on behalf of the engineering contractors, in strong support. Thank you. Red Thank Barrow you. with the California Landscape and Irrigation Council in support of the bill. Thank you. Uh, witnesses in opposition. Madam Chair, members, Tom Duffy, uh, once again, in, in opposition to this measure. Uh, it's interesting to listen to the testimony in favor of it. Th this is an option for school districts today. Districts may use the pre-qualification process. Most districts in California do not. Uh, when I built schools in Ventura County over the 20-year period I mentioned before, I never used this process once. Uh, it, it is something that adds process and it doesn't necessarily yield any benefits. Uh, so. The, the, the arguments in favor are that we're going to have safer schools and we're going to have better contractors. In the end, the pre-qualification process, in essence, is looking at the financial background of the contractor. Uh, you, you may not select out a contractor because the contractor has not built a school before or hasn't built a school as big as, as the one that you're bidding. So this really isn't a benefit to schools. There's no benefit by this bill. In essence, this is singling out of all public agencies, schools, and saying we're going to require an additional process for you that, that is going to require more money because of the process, more time, that is, personnel within the school district, and there is no yield that is a benefit to, to the school district it, itself. Uh, the, uh, this particular bill, and it, it's interesting uh, to uh, consider what you would have to do, uh, it, it's common to have portable buildings in school districts, and if you, you have some shifting population to move those portable buildings. 
I would, by, by the way this bill is written, I would be required to pre-qualify the movement of portable buildings because of the cost. If we're if we're exceeding exceeding the the fifteen thousand uh, uh, dollars that, that's provided for in statute, if I'm going to be slurry sealing a uh, a playground because it's gotten rocky and I didn't have monies because I didn't have any. Any, any dollars from uh, deferred maintenance because that, that's all gone over the last couple of years. If, if I'm going to do slurry seal and I have enough money to do that, I would have to pre-qualify doing a slurry seal on a playground to make sure that that playground was safe. Or if, if I was going to do some sort of replacement of air conditioning units. This adds process and time and doesn't use any benefit. What I'm understanding from the proponents of the bill is that we're going to get better contractors and I don't see it at all. I've been a practitioner. I've done this, and we, we're, we're opposed to this bill. We have talked to the opposition. I mean, we've talked to the proponents uh, because of our opposition about ways to maybe uh, be able to select better contractors, and, and we've talked about some process uh, to, uh, to do that, and I won't, won't bore you with those, uh, those concepts today. So, but we're willing to, to work with, with the author and the uh, proponents to talk about ways to allow us to be more efficient in the way that we are able to select contractors that really have built schools and, and have uh, not, not done those things that you've heard the proponents talk about that were negatives. But, uh, but it's interesting that, once again, uh, contractors and, and, and labor are wanting to tell us how to, how to do our business about building schools. We're quite competent and able to do that on our own. Thank you. Thank you. Next witness. Uh, Ed Maru again, immediate past president of ACCM and president and CEO of Neff Construction, uh, construction managers down in the Inland Empire area. Uh, to put a little detail to what Tom was talking about in terms of added process for school districts, I took a look at the last elementary school that we uh, managed and bid uh, uh, on a multiple prime basis, that is, where the district bids individual trade categories as prime contracts uh, relating to each particular trade on the project and hires a construction manager then to manage those contracts and supervise those contracts. So an elementary school bid six months ago would involve 15,000 additional pages of review. So this process would virtually eliminate uh, construction management multiple prime as an option in the K-12 school construction industry. And this is a very widespread process. I would say anywhere from 80 to 90 percent of the projects in Southern California have been built over the last 12 years using this process. And many of the projects in Northern California as well. Uh, the DIR document that's being effectively mandated here, because we all know there'll be litigation in terms of what is substantially similar. Uh, so districts by default wanting to avoid litigation will adopt that document, does not provide the flexibility that currently exists in the law, as an example, to pre-qualify contractors on the basis of schedule, a compressed schedule. Uh, that doesn't exist in this document. Let's say it's a summertime schedule and you're attempting to deliver the project on a compressed basis. You would want to select for a contractor that's able to deliver using a compressed schedule. This document does not allow school districts, does not contain the flexibility uh, to allow school districts to do that. Districts are currently uh, challenged with budgets and staffing. This added process and this added flexibility would challenge them even more. Um, additionally, uh, it's not the case that there are no current protections for school districts uh, as they contract with contractors for school construction. Of course, there are performance and payment bonds and insurance. The performance bond contains a one-year warranty provision, so the warranty period is covered for non-performance. Additionally, Construction defect under uh, the contract is covered by the statute of repose in the state of California, which is a 10-year look-back statute, meaning if the defect is discovered within seven years and the uh, lawsuit is filed within 10, there is protection for the school district and access to the insurance policy. That is, the insurance covers those, those defects. I took a look at the number of school projects approximately that have been constructed since 1998 based on the amount of uh, dollars the state has funded for K-12 school construction, and I come up with something between 700 and 1,200 projects in the state of California. Interestingly, we're only looking at a very small slice, four or five examples, out of 1,200 school projects uh, that have been constructed in the state since 1998. There is no data supporting this requirement. There is no 
general data supporting this requirement, that any of these failures are widespread in any fashion. For these reasons, I urge uh, a no vote on the bill. Thank you. I'm going to ask other uh, witnesses to be very brief, please. Madam Chair and members, Brian Rebus, on behalf of the California School Boards Association, were opposed. Please note, some school districts may have deemed pre-qualification to be unnecessary and they're happy with the pool of bidders in their region. This bill would require those districts to still pre-qualify and use a set of standards that requires a lot of staff time and um, an appeals process. We don't have a lot of extra people in the schools, so it would be costly and burdensome. We're opposed. Thank you. Madam Chair, Mike Ricketts representing the Torrance Unified School District, and uh, we share the concerns you've already heard, and for that reason, we're opposed to the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Any other witnesses in opposition? Uh, any questions from committee members? Yes, Mr. Vice Chair. Yeah, uh, what exactly the Department of Industrial Relations document that we're talking about here, does that relate to, uh, to the construction side or more of the labor side of, of construction of this? Someone very old. The DIR uh, modeled guidelines relates to the construction side. It asks some very simple questions to do a, uh, a, a basic pre-qualification of contractors for all public agencies. Interestingly enough, the year prior to the legislation implementing the guidelines for pre-qualification for DIR, uh, by DIR, school districts put in legislation to allow them the authority to do pre-qualification. So there was some uh, foreshadowing that, that school districts have always been kind of a pilot for pre-qualification and they've done it on their own accord. Mr. Vice Chair, if I also could, because it, it dispels one of the um, statements that the opposition made, and that this bill does not mandate or require um, the school districts to use the DIR document. They do not. There's a substantially similar clause within the bill that allows for local control for them to establish their own questionnaire and so to tailor it to their needs within their own local school district. And so we felt that would be best uh, dealt at the local level. Yeah, I, I guess my, my biggest concern, education is suffering right now, and they, uh, they don't have a lot of manpower. And when they start to talk about additional manpower to, to comply with this, I have concerns with that at this, at this particular time because uh, just because of the situation that they're in right now. So uh, I'm going to hold off on this for now. I have great concerns. Madam Chair, if I could respond. I have similar concerns, Mr. Vice Chair, and uh, adopting that language, we felt resolved the issue of manpower. The school district could tailor it to the amount of manpower that they have. If I could touch on one other issue, God bless you, is the issue on whether or not this yields any benefit. Uh, one of the gentlemen stated that uh, this yields no benefit at all. LA Unified, who does pre-qualifications, last year had an experience where their insurance policy was reduced because of their pre-qualification by $3 million. So at a time when school districts need to find any savings that they possibly can, bless you, I feel this particular measure uh, provides not only the assurance that tax dollars are being used wisely, but it's also helping save on the cost in uh, where their uh, insurance premiums will be reduced. Um, I actually um, have a question to the opposition, um, the representative from the School Board Association. Um, thank you. If you would just come back up here. Uh, you, you've indicated that you already have a um, pre-qualification uh, process that's required that you, that school districts must do now, right? No, I, Madam Chair, I think what my letter said is that some districts choose to pre-qualify, and it's, it's true that LA Unified does has a system in place that I believe that's substantial that that would meet the standards in the bill. So why are you opposed? Because some districts may have decided, and I apologize for repeating myself, but some districts may have looked at their their pool of bidders in their region and decided they're happy with who's bidding on their projects, and that pre-qualification doesn't add a value to the quality of who ends up in their bidder pool, their bidding pool. And so we're concerned that in order to access funding from the state school facilities program, and remember that's where most districts draw down matching funds for their projects, 
you would be required to follow down or follow the pre-qualification procedures that are specified in the bill, recognizing that the senator is right. I mean, the bill does say substantially similar, but we think that'd be a burden. Okay. Um, I, I guess I'm I'm trying to understand your opposition because you're saying that that, that pre-qualification does work for some some school districts, but shouldn't. What you're saying is that you don't want other school districts to to have this process. Is well, that? Let, let me let me try and boil it down. Uh, it works for I, some. What I'm trying to understand is, you know, the most of the opposition to this bill is um, your your members, and so I'm trying to better understand what the opposition is. If in fact school districts are, uh, you know, using pre-qualification process already, and if the bill strengthens that process by requiring this questionnaire, what is the harm? Right. So can you uh, address Remember, that? we've I'm got a thousand gonna, districts. I'm, I'm going to support the bill. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that the, I think that the bill strengthens uh, this, uh, you know, this pre-qualification process and it in fact will, you know, hold the projects accountable and it, it, it will ensure that we have quality bidders and, and you know, we, we have some process in place to, to strengthen public work. So I think it's a great bill. Um, but I also respect your membership and, and want to better understand exactly, if you could break it down for me, why you're opposed to the bill, if you're in fact already doing it. Well, remember, there are a thousand districts, not all of them pre-qualify. And I guess the way I would put it most clearly is that not all pre-qualification is the same. And I, I think districts should have the option to decide whether or not to pre-qualify. And then if those that do, we'd like for them to have more flexibility to tailor the process to fit local circumstances. But in fact, the senator has said that the locals do have that flexibility. Um, so I, I mean, I, I, I respect your position and, and um, really appreciate your testimony today. Um, I am going to support the bill if, some, if we have a motion um, and a second. Senator, would you like to close? And I, we really apologize, but we really need to. Madam Chair, I thought your statements were the best closing I could have ever have come up with, and so I just respectfully ask uh, for your I vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please call the roll. I will second the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Motion is due pass to Education Committee. Hayashi. Aye. Hayashi, aye. Barry Hill. Allen? Aye. Allen, I. Butler? Aye. Butler, I. Ng? Aye. Ng, I. Hagman? No. Hagman, no. Hill? Aye. Hill, I. Ma? Ma, I. Smythe? No. Smythe, no. Six to two. Mr. Liu, thank you for waiting. Um, members, I'd like to, uh, with that uh, objection, I'd like to uh, propose um, a consent calendar. Um, there are two bills um, by Senator Liu Correa. There's no opposition. Uh, file number uh, 4, SB 510, uh, dealing with real estate brokers. Uh, I, file item 6, SB 643, by Senator Correa. Um, there are no objections. I'd like to um, thank you. Thank you. Please call the roll. Hayashi. Aye. Hayashi, aye. Berry Hill. Aye. Berry Hill, aye. Allen. Aye. Allen, aye. Butler. Aye. Butler, aye. Ng. Aye. Ng, aye. Hagman. Aye. Hagman, aye. Hill. Aye. Hill, aye. Ma. Aye. Ma, aye. Smythe. Aye. Smythe, aye. Consent calendar is adopted. Thank you, members. Um, now we will hear from Senator Ted Liu, yeah. SB 702. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, every year in California, over a million dogs and cats are impounded, more than half are euthanized, and that's a cost of over $300 million to cities and counties. Uh, microchipping has been found to be an effective way of mitigating that problem. This bill does two things. Uh, first, it says if you're going to adopt a pet from an animal shelter, you have to microchip the pet within 30 days. And second, if you've lost a pet and a shelter picks it up and you get it back, you also have to microchip the pet within 30 days. I have witnesses here in support. You still have a few questions, I vote. Thank you. Witnesses in support. 
Holly Fermini on behalf of Social Compassion and Legislation, the sponsors of the bill, but I'll let our expert witnesses testify in support of the bill. My name is Alan Drusies. I'm the county veterinarian for Riverside. Um, I am here today as an individual. Uh, th this particular bill is not on the county's agenda, um, legislative agenda, but nevertheless, um, the need for microchipping uh, is acute. Uh, we impound uh, way too many dogs and cats that never find their way home. A microchip is the only way to permanently identify uh, an animal uh, and through the database uh, identify the owners and call them and get the animal back to them. Our animal control officers uh, have the scanners in their trucks. The animals are scanned as they're loaded onto the truck. My veterinarians and registered veterinary technicians uh, scan the animals again at the um, uh, examination and vaccination time. Uh, at every process uh, in at least the shelters that I am familiar with, at every stage in the process, the animal is scanned, um, and certainly before euthanasia. Uh, every effort is made to reunify these animals with their owners, and uh, clearly a microchip is the only physical way to do that in today's world. Good morning, Madam Chair, committee members. My name is uh, Dr. Tom Kendall. And I first have to say I'm not here representing the Veterinary Medical Board. I am a member of the Veterinary Medical Board, but I'm wearing my hat as a private small animal clinician here in Sacramento, involved with three veterinary practices on the private practice side, very supportive of microchipping. I've been doing it at the practices over 15 years. It's very, very safe. Uh, we have a lot of our clients that sometimes end up at the county because the animals uh, stray, and it's really important to have them identified. We've all seen uh, uh, light poles where you have lost animals, if they were all microchipped, we wouldn't have a problem finding them here. And I also, as far as the safety, there's been some question raised uh, in all the hunters we've done. We've never seen a problem. Just occasionally there'll be a, a, a migration of the chip rather than where we put it down a little bit lower, but this doesn't cause any problems, only just in finding where the chip is. Thank you. Next witness. Uh, Michael Arnold here on behalf of the City of Long Beach uh, in support of the bill for the previously stated reasons. Any other witnesses in support, witness in opposition? Questions from Perfect. committee members? Thank you. Senator Liu, would you like to close? Love and I vote. Thank you. Thank you. I'll second the motion. Motion is due pass to appropriation. Hayashi? Aye. Hayashi, aye. Berry Hill? Um, Allen? Allen I Butler, aye. Butler I Ng, Ng I Hagman, aye. Hagman I Hill, Ma, aye. Ma I Smythe, aye. Smythe I. Seven to zero. Seven to zero. That measures out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, we have several items on call. I'm going to have to call on item number ten, SB. 823 by Ms. Corbett. Please call the absent members. Hagman. Hill. Smythe. Five to zero, that measures out. Uh, we're going to lift the call on item number eight, SB 744 by Mr. Wylan. Hill, Smythe, Smythe I. Five to zero. Five to zero, that measures out. Um, item number nine, SB 747 by Senator Kehoe. Hagman. Hill. Five to two, that measures out.